So we've got a lot to cover this morning. This topic would actually do justice for a three-day symposium on its own. So uh, there's the three-day version, and then there's the three-word version of uh, this deck. And the three-word version is the future of work. Nobody really knows. Um, but in the middle is an hour that I'm going to try to cram in as much information as I can, probably in about 40 or 45 minutes, to get you guys up to speed. Uh, I have four objectives. The first objective is you understand that this is a big deal. It's, uh, this is a monumental time in human history. The second uh, item that uh, hopefully we'd like to cover, and I'll bounce to the agenda as I talk through this, is that it's coming fast. And why is it coming fast? It's all about technology. The third topic we'll be covering is, well, what might it mean? What could the future of work look like in 5, 10, 15, 50 years? And then last but not, certainly not least are some takeaways for you all. You know, what do I need to do as an individual, as an HR professional, as a citizen to prepare for this today and in the future? So a lot to take care of, so I'm going to ramble pretty quickly for about 40 minutes. I've got a lot of information. My intent is to get to a point where we can do some Q&A interactive. I also have a robot, will, will, a, uh, job, will a robot take my job quiz if we have time we can run through this if it's kind of interesting. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Before I jump into the information, I do want to share the source of a lot of the information I'm going to share today. There's a lot of competing information on this front, as you might know. It's a pretty controversial topic. I mean, it involves science, it involves religion, it involves politics. There's, there's folks all, all over the board. Um, Byron and Pascal, I reference their information because it's fact-based. It's based on history and studies, as you'll see as I progress. And they have a, they take an, op, an optimistic slant on the future. There are a lot of doom and gloom pessimists out there that I'm sure you read about in the newspapers and magazines, and we'll touch on them as well. There's a few definitions there. Anytime you hear the word technology, it's not your cell phone per se, it's anything that can be used to utilize to enhance human ability. And then a robot is, you know, you might think a robot is the uh, humanoid looking uh, mechanical person. It's actually uh, the, the Definition for robot for this presentation is it's, it's, done, it's doing labor that was previously done by a human. So that can be a software robot like uh, what I work with or a physical robot that moves around in space. And then last but not least, the biggest disclaimer of the presentation, there are a lot of computing, competing viewpoints on this and they're mostly based on beliefs and not knowledge. So Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, everybody has a slant on this particular topic. Most of it is beliefs because we just don't have clear visibility out into the future yet. So let's first stop at a history lesson. So Byron in his book, hence the name The Fourth Age, says that there are only four times in human history where technology has changed the course of man. Certainly the first three you're familiar with, right? The fourth is where he says we are today. We're at the fourth age, robots and AI. And that started about 475 years ago. Sir Francis Beacon invented the um, scientific method in about 1680 that really accelerated scientific development. And about that time, the printing press hit. So they were able to distribute information and really gain momentum. And that has, as you'll see in a moment, really accelerated the last 50 years or so from a uh, technology perspective. And then Pascal, he, uh, in his book, takes a similar slant where we're currently in the first, the fourth industrial revolution. I think you're probably familiar, certainly with the first one, machines and steams, steam, then there's uh, mass production with Henry Ford, computers in the 50s, 60s really gained momentum, and where we are today is certainly in the AI and automation, which mirrors up with Byron's thoughts. Now, you think about the industrial revolution, that took about 100 years, and that impacted what? Mostly blue collar workers? The AI revolution, is going to take, they say, 30 or 40 years, and it's really going to impact white collar workers. And we're about 10 years into that 40 years already. So it's coming very quickly. So that's a little bit of history lesson. Let's jump over and take a technology timeout so you can understand what's coming at us and why it's coming at us so fast. <clears throat> so how many of you are familiar with 
Mr. Moore and Moore's Law. How many people have heard of that? So we've got a few. He states that the number of transistors on a integrated circuit doubles every two years. He said that in 1965, and it holds true to this day. It is somewhat losing steam. Uh, integrated circuits are so compact, it's nanometers now, un believe it or not, you can fit 10 billion transis transistors on an integrated circuit the size of your fingernail. So they don't know how much longer the double every two years, it's actually happening every 18 months will last, but it's still going. So what does that mean? If an integrated circuit doubles, the power and speed of computers double. So it's been gaining speed exponentially and, and humans have a terrible time understanding exponential growth. Compound interest, they just don't get it. So Byron uses two scenarios in his book, and I've got a visual after this slide to help emphasize that. So I don't know how many of you all are familiar with the rice and the chessboard story. So it goes like this. So apparently back in India, there was an emperor and he loved games. And there was a peasant that invented the game of chess. So he went to the emperor and showed him the game of chess. And he says, wow, this is amazing, I love it. She said, what can I do to reward you for this amazing discovery? And he said, I'm a simple man, all I want is some rice. And he's like, okay, well, I can take care of that. Tell me, how, how much rice do you want? He said, well, all I want you to do is put one grain of rice on the first square of the chessboard, two grains of rice on the second, four grains of rice on the third, you see where I'm going, doubling every time. If you do that, by the time you get to the 64th square, more rice will be on that board than we're ever, that's ever been uh, cultivated by humankind. It would fill the country of India four and a half feet in rice. So again, the, the power of exponential growth. So the king apparently threw the uh, peasant in jail. He didn't get to uh, um, experience the exponential growth he had hoped in rice. Uh, also, an, a similar story, dominoes in New York City. Everybody knows a domino, right? You line them up and put them in a line. If you were to take 32 dominoes, the 32nd domino in that line, if it was 50% bigger, if it doubled every time, would knock over the Empire State Building. So very fast. So from a technology perspective, you know, you heard about the size of the dominoes and the amount of rice. Uh, we're at about square 60 to 61 from a technology stand, AI standpoint on the chessboard. So we are motoring people. It is, uh, things are gonna start happening very quickly. So what has this acceleration done for us? Obviously it's uh, taken computers and uh, escalated their capabilities, which is driving all of the AI growth that we're currently seeing. You know, quick uh, overview of computers. Uh, started in 1821, Charles Babbage, he designed a machine. He never actually built it. Uh, London University built it and it weighed 10 tons, but it did work. Uh, they built it about 10 years ago. Alan Turing, he's from the movie Imitation Game. He uh, built the first computer, which is up here on the right, that used bit on, bit off, ones and zeros. That's the foundation of uh, computation today all the way up to the current supercomputers that we have. So he was pivotal in that and it has escalated since then. It's escalated so much, I, two quick illustrations there. I don't know how many of you, if anybody is lucky enough to have an iPhone 13 Pro, just came out not too long ago. It's the fastest cell phone that's ever been built. It is actually more powerful than the largest supercomputer in 1996 that was owned by the Department of Defense. The iPhone weighs seven ounces and it has one chip in it. That supercomputer in 1996 has 9,950 chips and it weighs 10 tons. So uh, that's how fast uh, technology has progressed to date. And then going forward, uh, Byron uses an analogy. The, it took us 5,000 years to get from the abacus to the iPad. It's a pretty big step in technology, right? In 25 years, the iPad of 25 years from now is gonna be as different as the iPad today is from the abacus. So again, power of exponential growth. So that exponential growth is driving artificial intelligence. That was a term that was identified in 1950, 1955. The gentleman that identified it later had some reservations. He shouldn't have called it artificial intelligence. Folks get confused. Is it artificial? Is it not real? You know, what does intelligence mean? But nonetheless, it's grown and it's currently 
two silos that artificial intelligence runs in. There's narrow AI or weak AI. That's a, a, a wimpy sounding name, but it's an amazing technology that focuses on a particular task. So it think self-driving cars, think Roombas, think Alexa, very powerful. And that has gained steam <clears throat> here recently because of machine learning. The AI can teach itself from the computers. Uh, it used to be that a programmer would have to program a computer to learn, now it can learn itself. So you wanna teach a computer how to tell the difference between a cat and a dog, send it a million pictures from the internet of cats and dogs and it can look at it and figure it out itself. And then there's the artificial general intelligence, which a lot of people jump to for the, you know, robots are gonna take our jobs um, scenario. That is intelligence that has not trained, it can train itself as it encounters issues. So like a human, oh my gosh, I see a problem. How am I gonna address that? It's never been trained on this problem before. It can figure it out itself. Think of a uh, robot MacGyver. So that technology is not here yet. Uh, there's differing uh, thoughts as to when it might be here. I've heard 2040, I've heard 2099, but obviously those capabilities are critical for a robot or a computer to completely take a job. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then another uh, tool that's utilized with AI and computers is what our firm does, and that's uh, robotic process automation. That's a combination of software robots and narrow AI like OCR, chatbots, uh, signature recognition to automate back office processes that are currently manually being done by humans. So a lot of efficiency gains there. So let's talk quickly about robots. The world's first robot was built in 1967, so not that long ago. It's a picture of it there on the screen. They, uh, the professor that built it was gonna have an article in Newsweek. They said, you gotta name this thing. What do you wanna name it? And you know, oh, let's name it MR649. He said, no, let's call it Shaky because that's all it does is it moves around a room. You could think of it as a glorified uh, Roomba this day, but it is actually, it was pioneering technology that it could navigate itself around a room, around objects, pick things up, et cetera. Uh, they have grown and, and uh, progressed rapidly. However, they are not where a lot of the Terminator videos, robots are gonna take our jobs are today. There's, you know, there's, uh, uh, Makarov's law states that the, the hard stuff is easy and the easy stuff is hard for automation. So the hard stuff is easy. A computer can do a quadratic equation or beat the grandmaster in chess in seconds, but a computer to sort and fold laundry or a robot, extremely difficult to pick up an egg, things that we take for granted. A uh, big challenge for a robot is to go into a cabinet, grab a you know, get the tomato soup and make sure it's the one with the oldest expiration date and take it over and open it and put it in the stove. Pretty simple for a human. Just to open a cabinet and determine which of those cans is tomato soup, extremely difficult for a robot. Due to exponential, exponential technology growth, they're progressing quickly, but they're not where they need to be again to walk in and uh, completely take over a uh, human position. That are targeting robots, when you hear robots, they're gonna be targeted to the, the four Ds. Dirty, dull, dirty, dangerous, and dear jobs. A dull job is uh, what our firm works in. That's repetitive and mundane. That's key in data all the time. You know, robots are really good at that, especially if it's rule-based. A dirty job, those are jobs that you really don't think about that people have to do, like sewer inspectors, um, milking cows, autopsies. There's robots in all of those fields today. Uh, dangerous jobs, that certainly makes sense. Military bomb defusal, um, any uh, SWAT team, robots, fires, um, any inspections in dangerous places, and then deer jobs. Well, what does that mean? That was recently added. Those are uh, jobs that are deer from a, the ability to save time or money. A great example of that is Virginia Tech uses these uh, dog looking robots from the company up in Boston that inspects buildings under construction. So it'll go in with a building with a 360 camera, check the progress of the building. Oh, that light six inches to the left. You got to do a change order to move it. So it saves a lot of time and money from a uh, project management perspective on the building front. So here's a visual. People are visual learners. This is a visual that represents the power of doubling. So this assumes in 1940, you took one shot glass of water and poured it in Lake Michigan. 
And then you, the next 18 months later, two shot glasses. Well, as you can see, as you went across, from 1940 to the year 2000, you were pouring water in Lake Michigan, doubling it every 18 months. You didn't see anything happening. And then watch what happens from 2020 to 2025. It goes from 40 feet all the way to full. So again, this shows you the power of exponential growth and how it accelerates rapidly at the end. That's going to be key to push all of this technology closer to us. You can't look back in the past and try and determine the future. So let's take a, uh, let's jump over to philosophy class. This should be interesting. Uh, philosophy, there's three big questions from a philosophy standpoint that form the lens that folks look through to determine the future of work and the engagements of AI and robots in, um, the job, in the employment arena. So the first question is, what's the composition of the universe? These questions have been asked for thousands of years. There's two th schools of thoughts on this, monism and dualism. Monism is, there's no difference between, we're all atoms. There's no difference between me and an iPhone. I mean, yeah, the atoms may be aligned differently or different. So um, we're all atoms and, and that's what we are. Well, the dualism says we're atoms in something else. Well, there's, you know, I'm a little different than an iPhone. There's maybe a spirit or a person or a personality here. So how you view that question will determine your views on how quickly uh, robots will be able to replace humans. A lot of the hardcore AI robotic folks are obviously in the first camp. We're just atoms, we're just like iPhones. Uh, the second question is, what are we? Machines, animals, or humans? You know, our, the hardcore uh, AI folks, a lot of them are in the first camp, we're just machines. Um, you know, some of them refer us as meat machines. You know, we're skin and bones and we have chemical reactions and we can, we're, we're mechanical. Then there's the next tier up, animals. Uh, life makes them different than machines. What is life? We don't know the answer to that. So how would you know a computer had life? These are the type of philosophical questions we're trying to answer. And then last but not least is humans. Um, they're one step up from animals. They're a machine, they're, they're life, they have life like animals, but, but there's something different. I think we're very close uh, genetically to chimpanzees, but we're as far apart from chimpanzees as chimpanzees are from machines. So that's a, another lens you look at. And then the last question is what's yourself? So what's that voice in your head? So the hardcore AI, um, monism, machines folks would say that voice in your head, that's just a clever trick of your brain. It's your brain doing its thing and it, whoever screams the loudest. So if you were going down the road singing to your favorite song and you passed a state trooper, someone else would grab the mic real quickly and say, hey, were you speeding? Slow down. So um, the second answer to self is an emergent mind. There is a someone in there, there is a me. When I look in the mirror, I know that there's a me there. And then the third uh, answer to self is the soul. I mean, there's a soul, there's a you know, spiritual component to that. If I talked on the streets, I would think most people would probably number three, correct? Um, that's typically the answer on the street, but a lot of the, uh, you know, the AI robotics folks are up in the ones or two section. So again, you'll see this as we chat about the impact of uh, robotics in, on the workforce here in a moment. These are different lenses you would look through to try to see into the future. So work in a world of robots, what, that, what might that look like? So what will happen? Will we get more jobs, less jobs? Well, <laughs> there's three things that could happen. Number one, robots take all the jobs. Um, number two, they take some of the jobs, and guess number three, they take none of the jobs. So how many folks, let's take a quick survey, how many say number one? Okay, how many say number two? All right, that's good, middle of the road, and then number three, anybody takers there? All right, so good, at least I know where I stand as we head into this. So take the all jobs, they're gonna do everything better than a human. 90% uh, of all jobs. You say, well, all jobs, why would it not be 100%? Well, there's still gonna be jobs that we don't want them to take. So do you wanna go see the Nutcracker or a ballet with a robotic ballet dancer? Probably not. Do you wanna buy your mother a handcrafted vase from a robot or a human? 
probably a human. So there will be some jobs there they won't take, but they're going to take everything else. Number two is they'll take some of the jobs. They'll destroy more jobs than they create. Um, they still won't take the art jobs I talked about. And then some jobs require a lot of high EQ, like a CEO, or a lot of physical dexterity that they can't do yet. And that's like, you know, a car stereo installer. And then uh, that one, though, you know, certainly the first one is going to take out uh, the employment sector. The second one, that would, uh, Byron says, drive about a 29% unemployment, which is Great Depression. So most people will have work, but a lot of people won't. I think the highest the unemployment was during the pandemic was 13.8%, and that was pretty disruptive, as you know. So that's a tough one. And then the third one, they'll take none of the jobs. We're creating jobs so fast. Uh, everyone will have work, and there's an infinite supply of jobs. So let's deep dive into each of those. This is the first scenario. Robots take all the jobs. There's a lot of people in this camp. Mr. Musk there, I don't, you probably just know from the picture, right? He says that AI's, um, that robots are going to be able to do everything better than, than humans. You, you need to start worrying. And then Yuval Hari, who is down here in the bottom right, he uh, is in the same camp. We better start worrying. He actually did an interview with Anderson Cooper in October on 60 Minutes. It's about 12 minutes long. Take a note and watch that. You'll be like, oh, my goodness. Um, he's concerned that AI will get in the hands of a dictator or in the wrong hands and, and be uh, a detriment to society, even though it is powerful. So there are eight assumptions. There's going to be a lot of words on this screen. I'll break my PowerPoint rules. Uh, that have to hold true for this to happen. And I'll quickly bounce through them. Number one, it has to hold true. Humans are machines. Well, we talked about that in the philosophy side. If you think humans are machines, then making a robot human is possible. And if it's possible, it's going to happen because technology is, is going to take care of that. It might not be 10 years, it might be 100 years, but it's going to happen. But if you think humans aren't machines, then there's no way to build a machine version of a human. Uh, so, okay, you do think they're machines. Let's, we can build one. It's got to have uh, batteries and all the different components. So if you can build a mechanical human, it's going to have to have some mental capabilities we don't even understand today as humans. We don't understand the brain. We don't understand how creati creativity works, where ideas come from, how a person dreams. Well, it's going to have to have all of that, and it's going to have to have a conscience and it's gonna to wanna to do our dirty work. So if we hire a robot to clean our socks and it would rather write poetry, um, we're gonna to have to force it to clean our socks. So then whether it's willing or not, we'll have to compel it to do that, creating de facto robotic slaves. And it continues on. Well, to have that mechanical robotic slave, they have to be cost effective to build and uh, deploy. I mean, you're not gonna pay $100,000 for a robot to replace a $15 an hour employee, right? It just doesn't make sense economically. And then last but not least, humans lack the ability to find other tasks that machines cannot do. So as soon as a job comes out, we don't need a human for that, a robot can do it. Um, and jobs are coming out every day. So certainly a lot of assumptions there that have to be met to meet that first criteria. Byron says, not today, not any time in the near future. Human robots are centuries away from having the mental capabilities like creativity, um, empathy, those type things. So let's go to the second scenario. This is robots and AI take some of the jobs. So that graph, somewhat scary, that's from the World Economic Forum. And uh, that says in 2024, there will be machines performing more, uh, a higher percentage of work activities than humans. So that machine line is rapidly going up, the human line is going down. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing, that uh, it gives humans the chance to uh, work on other activities and, and certainly uh, increase productivity. So the five assumptions for AI and, and take some of the jobs, machines and technology cause a net loss of jobs. You hear that all the time. That assumes there's only a definitive number of jobs. There's one million jobs out there, and that's all there is. If a robot takes one, that means there's only 999,999 left for humans, and so it works. That's not the case um, historically. Technology has replaced jobs through all of history. 
Um, I mean, golly, go back and look at uh, the folks that delivered ice before the refrigerators, the folks that were in charge of lighting the lamp posts at night before electricity, stable boys before the cars came along. Um, I know, and in, in certainly in my lifetime, about the full service uh, fuel attendants that used to come out before the automated gas machines. Now granted, that's a, a very difficult transition for those people that are in their roles, but so far they've gotten through. I mean, employment hasn't tanked, hasn't been the doom and gloom that some folks talk about. So then it'll say, well, too many jobs will be destroyed too quickly. The assumption there is a robot's gonna come in and say, oh, you're an HR manager, I want your job, I've got it. It's extremely difficult to destroy a job. Certainly components of jobs will be automated, no doubt. So, you know, typically uh, some folks say probably 40 to 50% of any given person's job can be automated. Now, most organizations, that doesn't mean, oh wow, you know, I've got a half an FTE extra sitting around. Most companies are so short staffed these days. Wow, what a great opportunity to redeploy a resource. If I can get 20 hours of work from uh, a week from someone, wow, I'm gonna have them do, do these uh, different things. There's not enough jobs being uh, created quickly enough. Jobs are being created at an exponential rate. Um, just think, I know for those of you that have to search for positions, some of the most sought after positions today didn't exist five or 10 years ago. I mean, you talk about cybersecurity, data analysts, data scientists, they didn't exist. You know, RPA professionals 10 years ago didn't exist. Jobs are getting uh, created at a, a fantastic rate. They say that six uh, elementary school children today 65% of the jobs they're gonna have don't even exist yet. So uh, the job market is flourishing and growing. Low skilled labor workers will be the first to go. You hear that a lot. And, and to a certain extent that is correct. But in the uh, AI revolution, don't confuse employee, you know, low wage, low skilled jobs with ease of automation. Let me give you an example. I'll give you two jobs and you can tell me which ones are gonna be easier for a, an AI robot to take over. One is a, wait, a waiter in a restaurant. We're all familiar with that. Certainly a lot of tasks they have to do. The second position, a highly compensated radiation oncologist that reviews mammograms all day. Which one of those jobs is gonna be easier to, to automate with AI and robotics? Right, the physician, certainly much higher compensated than a waiter. So, you know, you have to get that thought out of your head. This is cutting through the entire job space, not like the industrial revolution that was the uh, typically the bottom manual labor tier. So the low skilled workers aren't, won't be the first to go. But again, it's not taking jobs, it's enhancing jobs, taking parts of jobs. And then last but not least, there won't be enough jobs for these workers in the future. That is a big one, you hear that a lot. Now Byron's take on that is the capability for everybody to, to stay, take a step up. We've seen this through history to advance humankind. Let me give you a really quick example of that. If I'm Amazon and I just put 100 robots in a warehouse, I just displaced 100 warehouse workers. Well, at the top, so, oh wow, I've got these robots, I need a manager of robotics. I don't have one of those. Okay, well let me take an IT manager, I'm gonna promote him to the robot director. Well, then I've got, oh, I got a senior programmer, I'll make him the IT manager, and everybody takes a step up. And then down there at the bottom, maybe I had an intern that was doing desktop support, he got promoted to being a senior support analyst, now I have an opening for a, a desktop trainee. How about you know, the warehouse workers? Could they potentially scale up and train into that position? Yes, you know, a warehouse worker doesn't have to make the step to transition into the director of robotics. It's everybody takes a step up. Now that takes work and planning and we're gonna talk about that, but uh, jobs are created all the time and there's an opportunity for folks to grow. They have to be willing to grow, they wanna we, uh, want to grow and be assisted to grow, but the, the opportunities are there. And then Pascal says, the fourth industrial revolution will be different than the three due to the speed. So again, that graph over there, it's coming at us very quickly. So uh, it's not like the industrial revolution took 100 years, um, we have to get in front of it. And then the last job, sorry that's been cut off, is robots will take none of the jobs. Over here is a chart from recent studies on the impact of automation, World Economic Forum, Gartner, McKinsey, they all say that more jobs will be created then have been displaced um, with the uh, automation and artificial intelligence in the future of employment. So three things have to happen in this scenario 
for none of the jobs to be impacted. There are many jobs that machines will not uh, be able to do. We've talked about that. You know, that any particular machine takes, does, uh, any particular job takes dozens of skills. And there are skills that uh, like empathy, creativity, idea generation that robots can't do and probably won't be able to do for centuries. There's an effect, an infinite number of jobs. Again, jobs are being created so quickly that one job taken creates certainly a new job, maybe even two or three. And then last but not least, you know, we'll work, we would work anyway. So, um, you know, the fact that we're just gonna go lay on the couch when a robot takes over our jobs isn't necessarily the case historically. Um, history hasn't proved that out. You know, there's uh, the um, keeping up with the Joneses and uh, the standard of living that folks want to work and make a difference in the world. And then uh, Pascal would say that he, th he seems to think that the Industrial Revolution will bear significant similarities to the first three. That, you know, there was e extreme uh, increase in production, you know, labor took a, took a little bit of a dip, but then, then recovered and everybody progressed. Both of the gentlemen, both of those books, this is the uh, slant that they're taking on will robots steal our jobs? No impact. If you ask me, I'm probably 2.5. Um, not at a two, not at a three, probably halfway between the, the two, um, but we'll see. The concerning point about it is the speed at which it's coming and, and as a society, whether we're gonna be ready for it and get in front of it. Um, so uh, foundations for the future. So what do we do about this? Um, there's five imperatives for preparing for the future of work. So change is certain. We don't know when and what, what it's gonna look like. So. You, Evolving skills is key, and uh, that you know takes in learning and education is a big component of that. There's a chart over here on the right. I don't know if you can see it, but that's by uh, Bernard Goldstein. He wrote a book, Prepare Yourselves and Your Children for the Age of Artificial Intelligence, and he uh, has a new take. He, he's a futurist from an educational perspective, and he said, you know, our current education system, and that includes elementary, public schools, colleges, professional development organizations won't support the future of work. Um, you know, to quickly run through this, you need a foundation of three things, numeracy, literacy, and digital literacy. Uh, those are the foundational uh, knowledge. And then up the left is social uh, and emotional skills, collaboration, empathy, you know, we, we hear these in, in HR quite a lot. Resilience, you know, there's gonna be a lot of setbacks and job changes. Gone are the days where you get a degree in a particular uh, field and you go work 55 years in that position and get a gold watch. Um, there are gonna be a lot of changes and setbacks. You have to be have resilience. And then on the right side is uh, as we transition from knowledge workers to insight workers. Knowledge is not a, com is a commodity. You can ask Google a question and have the sec answer in two seconds. So you have to, we have to transition from knowledge workers uh, to be able to be insight workers, and that requires cognitive thinking, critical thinking, interdisciplinary training, knowing the business. And then last but not least uh, is the North uh, Star, and that's ethics and purpose, you know, baking that in to training. Um, you know, it's, I have two, uh, a Gen Z and a millennial children. And surprisingly, they are so dialed in on purpose. You know, when I graduate from college, I just wanna make a lot of money and buy a nice car. Um, they are, you know, certainly purpose driven. So that's good to see, but that, you know, they're really not equipped with a lot of the tools that uh, they speak of here. So I think as, as parents, as members of society, as, as folks responsible for development, that's certainly something to get in front of. Uh, incentivizing collaboration with technology, don't punish it. Um, so uh, I would encourage folks to uh, get in front of that and then redesigning roles and reskilling employees. You probably have job descriptions, at least I hope you have job descriptions, right? Uh, how old are they? Five years, 10 years, 15 years? Um, jobs are going to change so quickly and you're going to have to get in a cadence of redesigning roles and reskilling employees at a much more rapid pace. Um, so there are AI tools available for that that are growing. There are AI process mining tools in AI that, uh, you know, not spying on people, but they can see 
what folks are doing on their computer most of the day, and that might have you tailor the way a particular role works. Well, golly, if you spend 10 hours a day in SAP HR, I didn't know you did that. Why is that? You know, you might have to tailor the uh, roles accordingly. Sharing the wealth, I won't get a lot into this. It's one of the political slants, you know, obviously uh, as uh, technology improves productivity, as productivity improves, then wealth tends to move to the hands of the few. You know, currently the eight richest billionaires in the world have the same amount of wealth as the 50% of uh, folks on earth. So certainly discrepancy in uh, income there. There's a lot of the futurists are talking about um, universal income as a possible solution to that. So we'll have to see. That's going to have to be taken care of. You know, if you're at 29 or 13 percent unemployment because of all of this, I mean, that's certainly something you have to get in front of as a society. Um, so rethinking of work. Uh, much of today's work, as Pascal says, sucks. Uh, 85 percent of employees are disengaged. Um, it's mundane, repetitive, it just doesn't fulfill my purpose. Um, so there's, but the good news is there's an opportunity with the efficiencies and productivities of automation to reinvent work. So what does that look like? Um, we can reduce work. I've heard four day work weeks. You know, certainly uh, the pandemic has driven the ability to work remotely. Um, I'm just thinking outside the box, what we can, can we do to work and reallocating some of that time back to that nor North Star activities for us as individuals, for employees, for team members, engaging folks uh, driving towards that purpose is a challenge. The reinventing education, I know we talked about that. It's, ew, that's tough. That's a barge in a bathtub to turn around all the way down, right? I mean, that's uh, less career-based, more holistic. I mean, it's, you know, education today is it's rule-based, it's steps. And guess what the first thing that AI and the robots are going to take out? Rule-based steps. Um, you know, you can't necessarily train to be an accountant anymore. Um, I mean, you can, but I mean, it needs to be more holistic. Again, back to the critical thinking and some of the other uh, tips there. And, and creativity and imagination in the new frontier are going to be huge. I mean, let the humans, they have creativity that robots don't. Let the robots handle the tactical. The humans can handle the strategic. And then last but not least is building a new society. Uh, again, this is huge. It's going to require government intervention. Um, that is the uh, confluence of AI and the environment. So AI is going to give us tremendous boosts in productivity, AI and robotics. Uh, how do we use that? Um, do we use it to retune the way our culture works, or do we use that added productivity to make more stuff and buy more stuff and consume more resources? So there's an opportunity to shift thinking of humanity to have a culture focused more on humanity and values. I got eight hours uh, extra a week because um, of added productivity. Am I going to build more stuff and buy more stuff for that eight hours, or am I going to try to solve you know, world hunger or you know, uh, poverty? So changing the ways in which, uh, ultimately, the ways on which we measure our worth. You know, is it keeping up with the Joneses or is it contributing uh, to society? And that will take two or three centuries probably to switch out of those rotations and some government assistance. The two, two, the two uh, imperatives above, one and two are imperative regardless of the path we go down, one, two, or three. But if we go down one or two, we have to get uh, three, four, and five taken care of as well. Um, so closing takeaways um, for you all, I guess, be ready. It's coming. Uh, it's certain. No one knows what the outcome is. I think, you know, keep a pulse, keep an eye out, know and progressive, you know, monitor your organization, monitor your roles, what's happening. You know, read about automation, be engaged. There's a lot of really good information online. Sherm does a great job with that. Embrace automation. Don't punish it. Um, but develop a, a strategy and utilize its be best practices and change management in deploying it. You have to ease into automation, not just drop it in and, oh, yeah, by the way, we just put these robotic order takers at the front counter. We're going to, you know, we're going to have to figure something else out with, with your particular role. Certainly not the way to do it. Um, and then as, as HR professionals plan, prepare, and evolve, we talked about supporting the transition from knowledge workers to insight workers. That's a huge paradigm shift. Um, you know, you're going to have to focus more on 
creativity, decision-making, uh, empathy, those hard, soft skills that uh, are a challenge sometimes to deploy and develop. Uh, proactive change management, again, support automation. Reinvent work, think outside the box now that productivity gives you the chance to reinvent how employees work. Prepare for frequent job redesigns. You know, HR needs to be engaged at the strategic levels because that's where you're gonna pick up at a, on a lot of these uh, job redesigns. Oh, we got a strategic initiative to automate the warehouse in 2027. Whoa, okay, that's huge. So what does that look like? Well, how do the jobs change? How are we gonna transition and adapt our employees over? You know, Amazon uh, is going to spend $700 million to train 100,000 of their employees that are impacted by the warehouse automation that they're going through. That's, you know, again, Amazon's big, and but that is a big step for them. So as organizations, we're gonna have to make Amazon level commitments and changes in order to proactively stay in front of the changes that uh, are coming our way due to AI and, and robotics. So um, wouldn't be a technology overview without a Dilbert cartoon. Um, any particular questions that come to mind? All right. I'm sorry. Yes. I know we have 15 minutes. <laughs> Bonus time. So in, any questions, thoughts, comments? Yes. So, you know, you've got basically, you know, cutting edge companies. Yes. Uh, and they are definitely on that exponential, right? But then you have all these small, Mom pop, medium size companies, right? You know, and it's almost like a you know economy. Mm -hmm. where all these companies are are just going to dominate the market, right? So in the future, is there going to be a room for these mom and pop shops that they're trying to embrace the automation? You know, hopefully there's an app out there for them, but they're understanding and going through the process of what to choose. It's just so challenging for them. They're not really on that exponential curve. That's a great question, and uh, been instructed by the videographer to repeat the question, so I'll do so. I think, you, how are the small companies going to compete with the big companies that have the, the assets and the dollars to deploy automation and all of these things we've talked about? Um, the, that's a great question. The technology is coming up from the bottom. Our, our, our organization specializes in small and medium-sized businesses in deploying robotic process automation. So the technology trickles down to the smaller organizations and progressive smaller organizations uh, will pick it up. Today, 95% of the Fortune 500 ro run robotic process automation. Probably 8% of small businesses use it. By 2028, 95% of small businesses is going to be using not, uh, robotic process automation. So if you get on it today, it's a competitive advantage. In 2028, it's going to be a cost of doing business. So the tools are, are there and trickling down to the smaller business. The good thing about the smaller businesses is they can pivot much more quickly than the big guys. Uh, if they see a, a need in the market, they can uh, digitally transform themselves thousands of times more quickly than uh, a, a large organization, you know, the barge in the bathtubs, the Amazons. So there are some benefits to being small. However, you have to be proactive, you have to look into the future, you have to be an adopter of, of technology. There will be folks, um, you know, I used to implement ERP systems back in the day and we converted from companies that we use, still use typewriters, believe it or not. So there will be companies that say, ah, I'm not gonna do that. And, you know, that they won't be able to compete um, because it's, it's inevitable. Um, so adopting the technology is key. The price points are coming down. You can pick it up in even at, at a small level and, uh, and execute in the space. That's a good question. Any other? So um, my concern, my question is around supply Yes. We, we use Mm -hmm. How do you think supply chain can um, advance so that this technology is available, or do you think the answer is that more U.S. companies need to be building this type of technology? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Supply chain, you know, computer chips is a recent example, and, and how do that, you know, how's that going to impact technology? Um, that is, uh, 
Elon talks about it, and uh, he seems to think it was just a blip on the radar screen, and we'll get it straightened away, and we'll onshore the development. Um, but there'll be the next issue. I mean, today it's computer chips. Tomorrow it will be, oh my gosh, you know, we don't have diesel fuel. We can't have boats moving containers. Um, I think it's the ability to adapt, but no doubt it's a concern. And obviously in your business, it's something that sets you back. Yeah, I mean, we've been struggling for two years since COVID hit. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's, it's almost comical, the, the, um, the difficulties that we're having in supply chain and how it's, the technology is there, we just can't get it. So if the answer is that the global economy needs to be more diverse and build more in the U.S., right. those type of companies that can supply it, that could be five years. Easy, right. Easy, five yeah. to ten years. So it's our technology that we build on, luckily we've got other products as well, but is that whole product line shut down until we Right. Yes. Right. No doubt. Yep. COVID uh, chips, you know, Elon, uh, said that his cars would all be self-driving by 2019. No problem. And here we are today and it's not even there, not even close. So he's had setbacks, government, other issues, pandemic chips. So yeah, that's gonna slow things down to a certain degree, but it's not gonna stop it because it's gonna continue to, to come. I mean, I read some folks say, oh my gosh, the government has to slow this down. We can't handle it. We're gonna tax robots or, or tax AI to try to, you know, and they say, well, that, that isn't gonna work either. So I think it's just being prepared for it and there will be bumps in the road. Uh, another question in the back. Yeah, so the, um, when you're talking about uh, folks that are considering the next technical right? Yes. Is that related to the general AI and the question of consciousness and what we're in? Is that what we're focused on? More, more so than the automation and what's really the, the job and the, what that's going to be like? Yeah, most of the, uh, not so much the jobs in society per se, I think it's just artificial intelligence and what it's going to know. You know, Elon has a subsidiary, some of you might or might not know about it. He has neuro, I can't remember the name of it, but it implants computer chips in your brain. Um, he's tested it on chimpanzees. They've been able to play Atari. Uh, you know, his, his first swath of that, which is great, I mean, to, to assess uh, in injuries. Um, I mean, it can read your brain signals if you've uh, uh, had an injury and, you know, get you through that. But then they're like, well, what else can it do? He said, oh, I think I was watching an interview that in five or 10 years, anyone with those chips, I can communicate with you and not even speak. You know, a lot of uh, information is lost in speaking. You've got to downgrade brain activity to speak it. And then the uptake of someone understanding it. So, those, that is what a lot of the folks, you know, especially the gentleman I mentioned on 60 Minutes, uh, Yanari, he, those are the folks that are, that's the type of thing they're concerned about. You mean, you know, our brains wired to the internet, which is coming, and what might that happen? How, you know, security, what if all of that knowledge gets in the wrong hands, which if the evil empire, wherever that might be, uh, gets a hold of that or steals it? Uh, not necessarily you know, the, this scenario that, you know, the robots are, are taking your job, but that's, that's a great question. So it's more about what we will do with it. It's like what we will do with it. And you know, it, the, the good news and the bad news is at the end of the day, the technology doesn't do anything. It's the humans. So you can either find comfort in that, or you can find concern in that, whichever angle you come at it. Uh, just a comment. Yeah. For example, Alexa. Yes. I think it's crazy. I think right. Yes.
uh, not the, you know, the private sector, I mean, technology as it moves, uh, Elon is in favor, and, and a lot of folks are of, you know, uh, government, you know, I don't want government involved, but maybe not government, but have a governing body, AI. You know, there's a whole issue around AI that I didn't address, it's ethical AI. You know, AI is as only good as the programmers that develop it. So if you if you create an AI bot that it selects screens resumes, ooh, who programmed that? What's it looking for? You know, how do you bake that into uh, the whole process? So there are so many tentacles that grow off of this and concerns. Uh, that combined with the fact that it's coming so quickly, you know, how do you stay in front of it? Um, so, all right, I've got a few minutes, and we'll, let, let's walk through a will a robot take my job? So this is a, a test that Byron put together. It's actually pretty good. Uh, so get out, I assume everybody has a cell phone. You'll need your calculators. So get your calculator out. I'm gonna ask you 10 questions and you'll need to score whatever job you're thinking of. Now you can score, think of the, my job, my spouse's job, a job in your organizations that you're worried about. So everybody got a job in their head? All right, here we go. So the first question is, how similar are two random days of your job? If they're all identical, score it a 10. If every day is different, like I'm an electrician or a movie director or a police officer, it's a zero. And you can score zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 on the scale on any of these. So put a number in for the first question. The second question, does your job require you to be in different physical locations, even different rooms? So a no, um, I stand in a, one place and take orders all days, a 10, the other end of the spectrum. Uh, a yes, I move around all the time. I'm an interior decorator, I'm a tour guide. So the job you thought about, score it. The third question, how many people do your job? Lots of people, it's a job everyone knows about, or a few people, I have to explain what I do, or maybe in the middle, eh, some people know what it is. So when you go to a party and they say, what do you do? and you tell them and they say, what is that? Or I go, okay, I get it. So the fourth question, how long is the training for your job? How long does it take to get up to speed? A few days, a few weeks, or, month or months or years? What's the lead time on training for your position that you're assessing? The fifth question, are there non-repetitive physical requirements for your job? Uh, no, uh, programmer, cashier, to the other end, yes, I'm a dance instructor. Certainly a lot of physical requirements there. So score your job based on the physical requirements. Number six, how long does it take to make the hardest decisions on your job? Less than two seconds, maybe you're uh, a toll booth operator, I need to make change, or more than five seconds at the other end, I'm a trial lawyer, and I just had something come at me from the judge. So score your job based on that question. Number seven, does your job require emotional connections to people or charisma? No, I am in data entry, I'm a construction worker to all the way to the other end, I'm a comedian, uh, a mayor, a politician. So score your job based on the emotional connection to people. Number eight, getting close to the end, how much creativity does your job require? None, warehouse worker, assembly line, to the other end of the creativity spectrum. I'm a writer, web designer, florist, artist, you got it. Number nine, do you directly manage employees? No, individual contributor to some at the middle and then the very end, yes, I mentor and coach employees as well. So uh, the last question, 10, sorry for the formatting, would someone else hired into your job do it the same way? So data entry, yes, key these five lines to this five lines on the screen, or no, I'm a screenwriter. It's pretty unique. So score your job there. Does everybody have a score? All right, let's see how you did. So here's uh, where Byron says, map your score from one to 100. If you're at 100, the closer you are to 100, the higher likelihood that your job would be automated. So if I scored this, for a fast food clerk, most likely it would be near 100. We go into McDonald's, we have automated uh, order takers. The other end of the spectrum, the never end, closer to zero, I think hostage negotiator, maybe 911 operator. So somewhere there in between is gonna tell you, safe for now, 70s a 10 year cutoff, 60s probably 15 years plus. So how many folks scored over 70? Over 60? over 50, 
Got some over 50s. How many over 40? How many 30 and below? 30 and below? 20 and below? Okay, so certainly down here in this area. Now again, that's not scientific, but it does kind of give you an idea. Now remember back to my uh, earlier, uh, got three minutes, uh, scenario where I talked about uh, you can't correlate low wage with who's over here on the right-hand side. That radiation oncologist is gonna be over here on the right-hand side as well. So you, you can't correlate that as well. But the most important thing, certainly as HR professionals, if you're a fast food order clerk and all of a sudden these order machines show up, you know, I come into work and see them, um, or you know, as an organization, certainly from a strategic standpoint, you know, gosh, with the supply chain issues, months and years ahead of time, that that's what the organization's gonna do. So prepare your employees for that. Um, change management, development, um, and again, that's automating a particular role. It's not automating the complete fast food restaurant. There's always going to have to be somebody that goes out and cleans and, and, and addresses issues with the customers. So quiz giveaway. So I have two quiz questions for you. The first, and I have uh, two giveaways here, if you can answer it correctly to, by raising of hands. I have two copies of Byron's book, which is amazing. So the first question, what square on the chessboard did I say we were currently on from a technology perspective? 60, okay. Wow, that was too easy. Uh, all right, so the next question, what percent of jobs did I say elementary school kids today will 65. Wow, okay, you all are awake this early. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure to chat with you. My contact information is up there. If you have any automation questions, robot questions, technology questions, feel free to uh, reach out. I think they are recording uh, this session for uh, sharing with other folks as well. Uh, obviously, it's an exciting time. I'm, I'm excited about it. There, a lot of changes are gonna happen, that's for sure, but it's uh, an exciting time to get ready for the changes ahead. And uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's all gonna be all right. So uh, AI and carry on. So thank you all for attending. You have a great day.